Welcome to the Media Pro Show, the show that gives you quick, simple tips to grow your business by serving as an expert in the media. Learn how to get all the TV, radio, newspaper, magazine, podcast, and online interviews and media appearances that you want, and learn how to be great in those media appearances. I'm Dr. David Geyer, orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist, and media health and wellness expert. This episode's a little different. This is a bonus episode, and I'm really excited to bring it to you. You know, normally every week I do a, you know anywhere from maybe six, seven minute episode to 15 minute episode, giving you one tip on one aspect of the media that can help you either get more media interviews or be great in them so you can grow your business. And this one is along those same lines, but rather than being one quick tip, I got the chance to do an interview that I think is gonna be really, really helpful for you. In this interview, I talked to Dr. Brent Lacey, who's a physician, actually a gastroenterologist, but that's not really why I wanted to talk to him. I, I wanted to talk to him because he hosts a very successful physician podcast, The Scope of Practice. And Brent has an interest in financial planning and financial aspects of medicine and people's personal lives. And so for physicians and other healthcare practitioners, this, the podcast gives great information on uh, you know financial aspects of your life and and in your practice it's really great and he's been very successful at it but i wanted to talk to him because i am fascinated by podcasts as a way to grow your business and he's got a perspective as somebody who created a podcast that's very successful but he also interviews people almost every week so he knows the side of being a guest on podcasts. So we spend about 45 minutes, and that's what you're about to hear, where we talk about you know, why you might host your own podcasts, what would make you successful at hosting a podcast. We talk about you know, the nature of your show. We talk about if you're gonna be a guest, what makes a great guest, how you, you know, decide your message and find shows that are good for you, all kinds of really, really helpful information. I've done a couple episodes where I share tips about podcasts, why they're helpful, and tips for being a great podcast guest. But Brent, I think, really brings terrific information. So I really hope that you enjoy this interview. So let's go ahead and get to that now. All right, we're here today with Dr. Brent Lacey. He's a gastroenterologist in the Dallas, uh, Texas area and is the host of a terrific podcast, The Scope of Practice podcast, where he's not talking medicine so much, even though sometimes medical topics come up, but he talks finances, the finances of running a practice and you know, personal management, doctors, dentists, and all kinds of healthcare professionals. It's a terrific podcast. Really excited to have him here. Brent, thank you for being here. Oh, thanks, thanks for the invite, David. I'm super pumped about this. We were talking a little bit off camera because you and I are a lot alike in the sense that we both have full-time practices, but we do media and social media on the side. Tell me about how you kind of went into medicine and then kind of how you decided, all right, I, I'm going to branch out from that. Well, so, you know, I got into medicine during my freshman year of college. I had definitively ruled out medicine and law as careers by the time I graduated high school. I knew for sure I didn't want to be a doctor. I knew for sure I didn't want to be a lawyer. And then spring break of my freshman year of, of college, I went on a medical mission trip to Mexico with the medical school in Dallas as a Spanish translator and just really felt like God was calling me to medicine. And so I uh, came back and changed to pre-med and did the entire pre-med curriculum in three years instead of four, which is not a strategy I generally <laughs> advise uh, for people, but it worked out pretty well. And then, um, you know, I did, uh, I did medical school in San Antonio and then joined the Navy and I did all my postgraduate training in the Navy. And one of the things that I started observing after I got out of fellowship is that uh, physicians, dentists, really all healthcare professionals are really good at being physicians and dentists are really good at their craft when they come out of training and they're really pretty lousy when it comes to managing the personal finances, uh, leading a team, managing a business. It's just not something we're trained for. It's not something that hardly any medical school in the country trains people for. And fortunately, I'd had a lot of really excellent business experience in college uh, running this huge organization. And I felt like that was something that was really beneficial to me and would be beneficial to more physicians if we could just get the information out there. And so I decided to start the blog and then later the podcast to uh, try to educate physicians to help them grow their leadership skills, grow their business and master their personal finances. 
Oh, that's great. And I agree. It's it's almost, I'm not going to say criminal, but it, it's a shame that we don't get that training in med school. I mean, there's a handful of MD, MBA combined programs, you know, five-year type of things. But yeah, just some basics about the financial side personally and running a practice would be so help, helpful. So you said you started blog and podcast. That was kind of where you started. I'm, I'm curious, uh, what what was it specifically about those types of media and social media as opposed to maybe writing a book of finance financial you know information for doctors well so i i wanted to start somewhere and i wanted to start somewhere easy cuz my thought was let's create a minimum viable concept right so uh, writing a book is a huge undertaking it is a tremendous <laughs> tremendous undertaking. And one of the things that I really wanted to do, frankly, was not to go into tremendous amounts of debt for uh, what might end up just being a very expensive hobby if nobody was going to listen. So I wanted to start something simple and you can start a blog for essentially free or very nearly free. And so I said, well, let me start with that. Let me put 30 articles on the blog and, and see if anybody starts picking it up and starts getting interested. And it started picking up and people really started to resonate. And I said, okay, there's something here. I mean, there's a lot of people that want to know more about how do I how do I become a better leader? How do I manage my team better? How do I develop a good team culture? How do I figure out how to plan for retirement? What does financial independence mean? There's people really want to know this stuff, and so it gradually started to grow. And the the blog was 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 fun, but I started thinking, you know, there's just there's just so much value that I can give people if if I'm able to have a longer conversation with folks. And if you look at blogs, there's the other thing is that with the, with the blogs, there's just a lot of noise. There's 500 million blogs and there's less than 250,000 active podcasts. And so there's just a lot less competitive uh, competitors for, for podcasts. And the thing that's great about podcasts is, you know, you're going to listen to it on your way to work. You're going to listen to it on the, you know, on the treadmill. And so you just pop those earbuds in and I'm in someone's ear for 30 minutes. And it's like we're having a conversation. There's just a lot of really great long form conversations that you can have and get really in depth and really, you know, suck the marrow out of a particular topic that way. No, that's absolutely. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show because podcast, you know, I do media, but podcast is a terrific medium, whether on either side, whether you're the host of a podcast or the guest of one. I'm curious, as you, you say, that's where you really got to have the long form conversations. Has it helped you get coaching clients uh, for financial coaching or has it helped your practice or is it more about kind of spreading your message to a larger audience? Have you, have you seen sort of a, a you know, a relationship uh, directly or even indirectly uh, to your coaching or to your practice? Yeah, absolutely. So the really more to the coaching side of things, because it's it, it, we really don't we really focus on uh, you know physician audience uh, dentist audience you know healthcare professionals and really focus on coaching people how to grow their leadership skills grow their business grow their personal finances and so it doesn't really translate into business for the practice because I'm not really specifically talking about gastroenterology topics but absolutely as I have gotten more and more people on the podcast you start building network connections with people and it has led to a lot of really cool opportunities I've gotten to be on. A uh, couple dozen podcasts in the last year. I've got I got asked to join a podcasting network of other physicians that are just superstar podcasters in their own right, and we get to we get to network with each other and really share each other's um, you know value and expertise. And it's started to lead to some really interesting projects. Uh, so there's a an, we just developed I just developed the first online course for. Um, helping people grow a thriving medical marriage. And, uh, you know, that it's just, just lots of really cool opportunities that, frankly, you wouldn't, I, w I wouldn't have even anticipated necessarily a year ago. Um, but it's, it's amazing how really interesting the connections can be and how, how much value add there can be from that. So if people are out there interested in thinking about uh, starting a podcast, let me encourage you. It is, it is fun. There's a lot of really cool connections you can make, and there's a lot of really neat opportunities that can come your way. That's awesome. And I, it's really great because it your topic, your niche is growing because of the podcast. But for the, you know, most doctors, they want to do media because, and this is probably true with dentists and, and really healthcare professionals, if they want to do the media, they're, they're generally, they're, First line goal is, hey, look, I want more patients. I want to grow my practice. Could a doctor, based on your experience and maybe some of the doctors that you've met through your, your podcast network, could you actually grow your practice through hosting a podcast? 
Oh, 100%. You definitely can. So it's all about positioning yourself as an authority figure, as an expert. And statistically, if you look at the way that patients find their doctors now, 88% of patients look up their doctor online before they ever set foot in their office. Many of those are finding their doctor for the first time by looking online. They're looking at patient reviews. They're looking at um, their websites. And so if you can position yourself as an authority figure, then, then yeah, it will definitely translate into increased business. And so, and so I'll give you an example. So if I'm, uh, if I'm an obesity medicine specialist, let's say, and I'm coaching people how to lose weight, then I can have, and if I have a podcast where I'm coaching people, this is how you lose weight. Here's how you make, here, here's why calorie counting works or why it doesn't work, or here's a good exercise program. And I start producing that content. Not only am I producing content that is going to be valuable for my patients, I'm producing content that my patients are going to want to share with their friends. You know, so if I become the authority figure and one of their friends says, man, I, you look so great. You've lost 30 pounds. This is fantastic. What's your secret? Like, well, you know what? I found this podcast. You need to go check it out. And it's, an, it's something that people can get for free. And if it's valuable to them, man, they're going to sign up. They're going to jump all over that. Yeah. I can't tell you how many books I've bought or products I've bought because of something I heard on a podcast. I mean, it's the craziest thing. So I, it seems to me that absolutely, if you if your goal is is growing your practice, the podcast could do that as well. It's like exactly what you say. It's how you share information and that kind of thing. Um, it, so you, now you've probably sold a bunch of people saying, oh, you know, maybe I should host a podcast. How would they get started? The re so I kind of do the traditional, you know, it goes through a website and there's, you know, podcast hosting and that kind of thing. But I have a friend that does a healthcare podcast. He literally uses a platform where he records on his phone. It gets uploaded and sent to all the networks. There's no website. I mean, it's super easy. How would you advise somebody to get started this? I know it's a little technical, but I think a lot of doctors get overwhelmed with the tech side of media and social media. So they just don't do it. I, 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 it seems to me that you could start a podcast pretty easily from a tech standpoint. You don't need to hire a huge producer and have a huge budget. No, that's 100% true. And that and I'm I'll be your, you know, exhibit A on that. So I don't have a significant tech background. I mean, I bootstrapped this thing from the beginning. Now, for me, I will tell you that I actually took a podcast course, uh, an online podcast course that I thought was tremendously helpful for me. But I think we need to back it up a little bit. I think if people are starting a podcast, they need to ask themselves, who's my target audience? What is my intended goal here? So for me, I knew that I was targeting specifically physicians, dentists, healthcare professionals uh, for this information. You know, I wanted to coach people that are in my same field and by and large, People that are in our field expect a certain degree of professionalism when it comes to really everything. You know, we just, we, ex we are willing to pay more for things. We're willing to wait longer for things if it's going to be higher quality. And so I needed to produce something that was going to be high quality. And so for me, I felt like taking an online uh, course related to podcasting and how to produce a high quality podcast would be valuable. That was actually a huge jump start for me. But if you're just looking to grow your business, if you're looking to keep something, keep it really simple, you're not looking to create a nationally syndicated thing that's going to be at the top of every chart. You just want to help the patients in your local community. Yeah, it can be very simple. I mean, you can legitimately record yourself on your iPhone with a, a decent pair of earbuds and create an MP3 file and then just upload it to a server. So like I use Buzzsprout, a lot of people use Libsyn, but you legitimately just go create an account. They help you sign up to all the directories and get your feed onto Apple Podcasts and Spotify and, and Stitcher. And then you just go and just click one button, upload MP3 file, and then you're done. Bam, you have a podcast online and it's just there. That's now, awesome. If you if you want to go for if you want to go for something more professional, higher quality, you need to spend a little bit more time than that because you're going to want to uh, have good podcast descriptions. You're going to want to have some search engine optimization. You're going to want to channel that into um, you know an email a service provider to capture emails for folks. You're going to want to you're going to want to make it a, a more professional, higher quality product. But if you're just looking for something very basic and very simple, you can record it on your iPhone and upload it with a single program. And if you're just doing that for a few hours a month, let's say, I mean, it's cheap. I mean, it's less than $20 a month. It's really very easy.
Yeah, I think mine, I used to use Libsyn uh, for a podcast I had years ago. The one I'm using now for my uh, Media Pros uh, podcast is uh, Burberry. And I, I think it's like $20 a month and it's it's super easy. I'm curious, uh, a little aside, which uh, podcast, because uh, I took an online course too, uh, sort of a, it was online, but you had live calls. Who? Which uh, course did you do? It was, was called, called Power, Power Up, Up Podcasting. Podcasting. It's by uh, Pat, Pat Flynn, Flynn of Smart Passive oh, yeah, yeah. Income. Okay, so, yeah. And I, I thought it was tremendously helpful, but um, that's a good one. And I know there's at least a few physicians out there that have podcasting uh, courses. So uh, a friend of mine from Spain named Ernesto Gutierrez, um, his, um, he has a podcasting course that he does. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Maisha Claiborne from Atlanta, she has one. Um, so there's a few different folks out there that are doing podcasting courses. And coaching is so important, you know, even if it's just an online course. Uh, you know, I've talked about this, why it's important for getting good at various aspects of the media. But you know, it, you you can learn how to do a podcast by just flailing and just get better, you know, and get better equipment as you go and all that. But having somebody, you know, a step by step tutorial that gets you there faster, I, I think that's fantastic. You've been doing this a long time. I think we figured out uh, maybe eighty podcast episodes. I, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but you've been doing it a while. Uh, so I suspect you've learned uh, a thing or two. Maybe you've gotten better at, over the time. What kinds of things that have what if what trip tricks trip <laughs> I can't talk tips tricks strategies have you sort of learned over the years that has made it easier for you to do this around a busy schedule? Has made it more interactive with people? What kinds of you know things would you share with somebody just starting out that might accelerate their learning curve? Yeah, so I think the first thing you got to decide is are you going to do an interview-based show or are you going to do solo casts? So is it just going to be you talking into a microphone and educating the, the, the public or is it going to be you doing interviews uh, like you and I are doing now? And those styles of shows are very different. If you start bringing other people into the mix, now you're talking about coordinating schedules and figuring out if they're a good speaker and do you have content that you can talk about and that kind of thing. So that's, that's where you got to start is what kind of show uh, do you want to do? I will say the biggest thing that has helped me is preparing for each episode. So every time I have somebody on my podcast, um, I am preparing for that. I'll, if it's someone who has their own podcast, I'll go and listen to a few of their episodes. If it's someone that has a, a book or a blog, I'll go and read it and I'll make, I'll make notes, I'll pull excerpts and I come ready to talk. I'm ready to have a conversation. Nothing is more frustrating for me when I'm on a podcast interview with someone else than when it's obvious that they have no idea what to talk about and yeah. we're just flailing. And it, uh, it, it doesn't bother me in the sense that it's, it's no skin off of my nose, but you know, I, it, it's just, it's just frustrating to, to watch that and just, and to see that it, it could be such higher quality, but you can really tell the difference between uh, an interview that someone has really prepared well for and an interview where someone is just coming and just kind of winging it. Yeah. And so I think the preparation step is probably the biggest key that I would say. The second thing that I'll say is that you can't make a good meal if you don't cook it with the right food. And what I mean by that is you got to find you got to find good quality content and you got to find if you're going to be doing interviews, you got to find good quality guests. If you just take any Joe off the street, you know, maybe they've got good good speaking skills, maybe not. Maybe they've got good things to say, maybe not. Maybe they have something, maybe they have some degree of uh, of an idea of how to act on a podcast, or maybe they don't. So you need to do a little bit of legwork in figuring out if you're going to find the right guest. And where I think that that really starts is just by um, figuring out if they have something worthwhile to say. And so, for example, for my podcast, uh, you know, I'm looking for people that can talk intelligently about uh, business management, leadership, personal finance strategies, things like that. So I'm listening to podcasts. I'm listening to, or I'm reading books. I'm uh, talking to fellow podcasters, I'm talking to podcast guests that I have on and asking people, hey, who do you who do you recommend? Who's someone that I should definitely have on? And so I'm constantly looking for more people that I think would be good to have on the show. So really preparation, preparation, preparation is the key. Yeah. Oh, I, and I love 
both you know the preparation for individual episodes and finding guests but then yeah thinking about what type of show you want to have from that's really good because some shows don't lend themselves well to just one person talking you need sort of back and forth uh, banner i personally like to listen to interview type shows i just think that's more interesting personally but some people you know the topic you know, it doesn't have to be that way so i think that's really great but with all that preparation you're talking about now i'm kind of curious um yeah, uh, you and I both work, you know, with our practices, so we're busy. Podcasts are, you know, they're maybe not as raw, like you say, writing a book takes a long time. But I mean, podcasts still require a lot of effort, you, and you, all that research of the guests and all that. How do, how would a doctor or dentist really do a podcast effectively and fit it in a busy schedule? Yeah, yeah, well, one of the, the things, things that, that is really, really great, great about the podcasting, podcasting community, community, and I say community because there really is a community. Um, among podcasters. Everybody that's doing this that isn't doing it full time is doing it exactly the same way that, that you and I are. So I have a full time gastroenterology practice and there's, I don't know of anybody else who's doing this kind of thing who's a gastroenterologist. But, um, you know, I do my recording when I'm available. So a lot of my recording is between 8 and 10 p.m. after my kids go to bed. Uh, a lot of my recording is from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. before I start clinic. Or if I have a, a Friday afternoon where I don't have any, I don't have uh, patients after three o'clock or something, then I'm I'm dropping a couple interviews during that. So I think that that is really helpful for people to recognize is that you can find ways to uh, work around your schedule. And I would encourage people that if you're thinking about starting a podcast, do not sacrifice your family time and do not sacrifice your work time. Okay, fit it in fit it in when you can. And so I remember when I was first starting the podcast, I was thinking, you know, I wonder if I can get anybody to do this if I record, you know, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. And then I remembered all the podcast interviews that I had already done at that point were almost all at eight o'clock and nine o'clock at night. And it is like, well, yeah, of course, everybody else has family time. Everybody else has work time. So yeah, of course, that, that totally makes sense. So I, I would encourage people to recognize that, yeah, you can definitely do it. Um, the other thing that I think is really helpful is find ways to batch your time. So try try finding days where you can just record two or three interviews at once. Do one at eight, one at eight thirty, one at nine, something like that, or or like on a Friday afternoon or, or whatever. But find where you can do two or three interviews all at once. You know, you get in interview mode and just bam, 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 knock them out. Or if you're doing blog posts, um, take a half a day or take a, a Saturday morning before the kids are awake or something and just knock out three blog posts in two hours or something like that. And then you've got, you've got a, a whole batch of content ready to go and you're not scrambling to find an extra half hour here and there. So that's another thing that can be helpful too. Yeah, I, I, that's a, just an enormous life hack generally. I mean, you don't do one piece of clothing and wash it at a time. You do a whole load of laundry at once. I do a month's worth of, I, I, my podcast is once a week, which I think yours is as well. Um, but I do a month's worth at a time and then, you know, you know, in one day so that I can, you know, do it over, you know, that this the next four or five episodes. You know, everybody has a different strategy, but I, I can't, I love your, your batching strategy. You mentioned a second ago, I wanted to follow up, but then I, I kind of went down a rabbit hole. But you, you talked about how you've been on uh, a guest on other people's podcasts. And I know you have guests on your podcast. I've uh, done your show sort of now from the opposite side, not hosting a podcast. But if you're going to be a guest on a podcast, what's the upside? Because I, I hear that from, from other doctors that want to do media. They're like, well, I'm not sure how doing a podcast would help me because none of those listeners are in my town. So they're not going to potentially see me as a patient. But what what would you say are some of the benefits of actually being a guest on other people's podcasts? Well, so a couple of things. One is that it hones your speaking skills. And so I think there is actually real value in that. Um, as physicians, we speak to patients all the time and we're we're speaking to other physicians all the time. But there is value in being able to hone your message to a, a short nugget that you can put on a podcast or that you can put in a media um, appearance of some sort. So I think there's real value there. The second thing is that it position, and this is probably the most valuable thing for most people, is that it positions you as an authority figure, it positions you as a thought leader. And so as you start to you know, build a corpus of experience doing these media appearances, like podcasts specifically, then you can start to point to those as proof that you have some 
you have something to say that you have some actual authority in this area. And so if, if I'm look, if I'm thinking about a gastroenterologist and I, I want to go to, uh, someone that, that knows what they're doing, I'm probably asking a, a friend or asking a, a colleague or someone, well, who would you go to? And then if, but if I'm just a regular average Joe patient, I don't know anybody from one person from another, but if I go to someone's website and see, oh, this guy's been on 35 different podcasts talking about the, the, you know, the, the brain gut axis and the side effects of PPIs and how to recognize when you have a stomach ulcer. This guy, this guy's done a lot of stuff. There's that it's, it's kind of a, um, it's kind of a social proof thing. You know, there's yeah. 35 other people that thought he was smart enough and authoritative enough to actually have them on their podcast. Maybe I should listen to that guy. So I think that there's, there's real value in positioning yourself as an authority figure. And even if it doesn't translate directly into business on a one-to-one -one basis, it will establish you as more of an authority than maybe your competitors. And so as people are trying to do some A-B testing in your local area and saying, okay, which gastroenterologist should I go to? Oh, look at this. I'm going to go to this guy who's been on 35 different shows or on 25 different media appearances because apparently everyone else thought he was had something to say. Yeah, I couldn't agree more that it's a huge credibility indicator. And I, I would argue, yeah, maybe the person in Spokane isn't coming to see me in Charleston, but if if somebody looking at my site sees those podcast interviews, uh, yeah, absolutely, it might influence them uh, to come see me as a patient. I think that's great. So, all right, then let's just go one step further. Then, so the doctor that this hypothetical doctor we're talking about decides, all right, yeah, I want to be guests on uh, different podcasts. How would they go about it? How, as as a podcast host yourself, how do people reach out to you successfully or unsuccessfully? How would they go out about getting on? On podcasts? Well, most podcasts have a website, and so that's a great place to start. Um, so really every podcast has a website of some kind because you have to upload your podcast to a podcast server to get it into the Apple podcast feeds and Spotify and things like that. And so if you're using something like Buzzsprout or Libsyn or Burberry, um, they will create a website for you. And it's going to be simple. It's going to be very basic, just somewhere where people can have all the audio players. But most podcasts, most professional grade podcasts will have a website of some kind. So that's a great place to start. And they should all have contact information. You'll say, contact me here. Or if, and a lot of them will even have, like on my page, on, on my website, I actually have a page that says, if you want to be a guest on the podcast, fill out this form and you know, tell me why and tell me what you have to say and why would it be valuable to our audience. So that's a, a great place to start. And the thing to remember is that if you're looking to be on a podcast, the way that you can most likely be successful in getting on someone's podcast is to position yourself as a solution to someone's problem. So you and I had talked about this when you were on my show, um, is that you know, as a podcast producer myself, like I said, I'm, I've got a busy practice and I'm spending time with my family. And if, if I get a pitch from someone that says, Hey, listen, I heard you talk about, um, you know, how to create a thriving team culture. And I really want to, I really think that you would benefit from hearing someone talk about how to deal with problem employees. What do you do with the person that just won't conform to your team culture? They're constantly gossiping. So here's, here's three blog articles that I've written on different people's, um, you know, websites about it. And here's, uh, 10 questions that I feel like I could answer very easily on your show. That guy just gave me uh, a, a podcast idea. He just gave me um, some authority from uh, some other source. They said, yeah, these three people published me and here's, so they thought I was good enough. And he just gave me an outline for a podcast episode. That just saved me a ton of work. And maybe I go with him, maybe I don't, but at the very least, I'm going to pay attention to that because that guy just turned, you know, an hour and a half's worth of preparation into 25 minutes. And that, that's worth, that's worth at least uh, having a quick, uh, quick look for sure. Well, and what's crazy is that I think that there are people that do that, that do it the right way. I agree with everything you just said, but I know that there's people that don't, that they just blast these pitches they're not personalized, like not even a first name. They don't. They clearly haven't listened to the show. But I mean, I got pitched not too long ago. It was like within the last two weeks for my media coaching podcast. It was somebody talking about travel. 
Like why and why would I talk about travel? So you do a little bit of research and show how you can help. I, I can't say enough about that because uh, clearly, uh, you know, you're helping the host. So then that our hypothetical doctor gets on. Let's just say your show. What make would make him or her a good guest? Is it you know an interesting stories to tell? Is it how you know you know how they promote their ideas? And 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 one step further than that, I guess, not just what makes them a good guest, but how could they promote their practice or build their practice? How should they do it, not do it? What what have you kind of seen? And I know you're, it's more financial, but people that have financial topics are still talking about their businesses. What? May, how can you do that effectively and still be a good guest? Well, so there's there's two aspects to that. I would say there's the technical aspect and then there's the content aspect. So let's let's start with the technical because I think that's a little easier. You need to have good audio and video quality and. And so don't don't just record off your phone if you're going to be or record off your laptop if you're going to be a podcast guest. Go get a microphone, and they're not expensive. I mean, so the one that I use is uh, the Audio Technica ATR2100. You can get it for ninety nine dollars on Amazon. Okay, so invest a hundred bucks, skip Starbucks for a month. Okay, <laughs> invest a hundred dollars in a decent microphone, and give yourself good audio quality because when you have that really tinny. Um, you know, sort of high pitched electromagnetic whine that comes through, uh, you know, the iPhone because you're getting feedback from everybody else's iPhone. It makes me want to turn off the podcast because I just, it physically hurts my ears. So get a good microphone. That's the first thing. Um, but from the content aspect side of things, what I would generally recommend to folks is that, you know, you have something, have something in mind um, to say. So prepare your you know prepare your thoughts beforehand you know it, you know like i said this is one of the areas where pitching questions to your interviewer can actually be tremendously valuable because it it helps you actually conduct the interview a little bit because it helps guide them to topics that you already know something about that you can already talk about but but have something to say and you know what you mentioned the stories i tell you what the stories are the things that people will definitely remember you want to bring practical content you want to bring actionable content you want to bring really good tips that you can give people you know something specific but i tell you what the things that people remember are the stories that you tell and the, that's the things that make them remember who you are maybe they'll remember some of the stuff you talk about but they'll remember how how your story made them feel um, and the the things that they remember tend to be the ones that have story attached to them so one thing that i think is a really helpful tip is to have a like a story library or a story bank in your mind of i don't know five maybe ten different stories of personal experiences that you can pull out in response to a question that you can adapt to various circumstances. So maybe you had an experience where uh, you had a, a, a vacation with your family one time, and that something that could be adapted to talk about uh, family relations, could be adapted to travel, could be adapted to um, why preparation is so important because maybe the vacation didn't go so well, or it can be adapted to any number of topics, right? So you have various stories that you have already in your mind that you could potentially adapt to multiple topics and that you could pull out at the drop of a hat if needed. The story thing is fascinating. I, I, I love story. I've actually worked with a story coach uh, for public speaking. And that story library, I mean, people call it different things, story toolboxes, is so important, though. If you want to give good public speeches, you don't do PowerPoints full of slides. You tell stories and then work information in there because that's what people remember. But yeah, podcasts, because one of the great things I like about podcasts is unlike TV or radio where you've got to give really short answers, podcasts, a lot of times you can expand and actually tell a story. And I feel like that's really where you get to, to make a connection. So that's a great, uh, I hadn't heard that advice for podcasting specifically, but the story library is fantastic. Um, well, and it's especially true if you're doing a medical podcast. So if you're going to do something where the goal is to drive business to your medical practice, and so it's going to be about your specific medical field, then that's incredibly valuable because then you can you can really make it personal and pay, and it really drives home an emotional feeling for folks. It really engages them in a different way. So uh, you know you know you talk about the importance of colon cancer screening, and so then you talk about um, a family or a, a colonoscopy that I did uh, you know three months ago on a patient that was. 37 years old and had a sigmoid colon cancer that we absolutely did not expect to find. And now, now he's doing fine. And if we had waited six months and just completely blown that off, 
uh, you know, he he would have it would have been stage four. It would have been too late. And as it is, you know, he's coaching his kids soccer team next fall. You know, like that's that's a that's an emotional engagement. That's something that someone goes, oh, yeah, I do care about that. Maybe I should yeah. go get my colonoscopy. <laughs> right. But it engages you in a very different way. And, and doctors are always worried about, you know, patient confidentiality. You don't have to give patient names and you can change the specifics until it's still tell a story. And what I've found too, public speaking, podcast, you know, I also love hearing stories about that guest, you know, why they in medicine, what was it about, you know, it, that happened in their lives? Maybe they had a family member that had cancer. In my case, I had a, an episode of anaphylactic shock in college, and that's why I went to into medicine. I love hearing those stories because it cr creates a bond that now I listen to everything he or she says after that. That's one of the values of podcasting is that because you're because someone is, is speaking to you directly in your ear in a lot of cases, it feels more conversational. It feels more like like friends. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, television actors and movie actors feel different to us in our minds. Like television actors, you, you see them more as 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 people. You see them because they're they're in your living room, right? You're watching them on TV versus you're watching them on the big screen. And, and I think that's, I think that's really true for, for podcasts too, that, um, you know, if, if you can find ways to make it personal for folks and, and really engage people on a personal level and story is a great way to do that, then they're going to listen more. They're going to be more likely to, um, think of you as a thought leader, as an influencer, and then they're more likely to find you as the solution to their problem someday. Like, Oh, I need a gastroenterologist. Who was that guy I heard on that podcast? Let me go look him up. And you all of a sudden become the authority figure in their mind. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic. And, and you know, telling stories and sharing helpful information, you and I have talked about this when we did yours and we talked about it even between uh, just off, off the air that, you know, create, you know, providing content as a guest, but this is true as a host, providing content that helps people in their lives, stories and information and helpful tips is ultimately going to help you convince them to come see you as a patient. You don't have to just be out there hammering, this is why you should come see me. In fact, I would argue that's sort of counterproductive, but usually podcast hosts at the end give you the chance to promote your, yourself and your business anyway, but it's really helping people um, that seems to really make a difference. And those seem to be the best podcasts, the best podcast guests. I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but that's what I tend to listen to. Absolutely. And so if, if, if you're telling a story about yourself, I think it needs to be in the context of how that then relates to the person who's listening, because the person who's listening doesn't care about you. They care about themselves. Right. And so, and so if you're telling a story about yourself, you got to bring it back around to them. If you're telling a story about why you're so great, that can be okay, but only in the setting of, so, you know, I did this great thing that makes me an authority figure so I can help you do the same thing, yeah. right? That, that kind of thing, it can be really helpful. The other thing I'll say is that with being on podcasts, it can lead to a lot of connections that you don't expect. So for example, I've had, you know, so I'm a gastroenterologist, but I've gotten invitations to speak to oncology groups um, that, you know, I otherwise would never have had the opportunity to speak to. Uh, just because someone heard me on the podcast and said, you've got something important to say, we would love to have you come in and talk at our grand rounds. Or I had a, I had someone reach out to me from New Jersey, uh, you know, and I'm in Texas. <laughs> I don't know anybody in New Jersey, but they, they heard me on the podcast. They're like, yeah, you, you've got, you've got something important to say. We would love to have you come and talk to our, uh, you know, our local, uh, physician leadership group. Um, so just, so don't, don't don't discount the possibility that there are opportunities lurking around the corner that you're just waiting to stumble into just by being present and just by putting yourself out there. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. And, and it does seem like it's starting to happen. I mean, from, you know, when I started social media 2009, I'm dating myself a little bit, but there was really, there were very few physician blog bloggers, very few physician podcasters, uh, you know, it just, but that's changing. I, I, I wonder as, you know, the group coming out of residencies and fellowships now grew up with Facebook, Facebook, they grew up with Instagram. I, I hope that we see more people 
doing this kind of thing. I, I, I feel like the, you know, whether it's just being guests on podcasts and preferably hosting, which I'm, you and I are big fans of, I really hope that we're going to see uh, more and more healthcare professionals embracing this new form of media to, to connect with the, the country, to connect with people. I I hope hope so. so. And I I think think it will. will. Um, The the podcast scene has grown uh, just in leaps and bounds in the last five years. So five years ago, 12% of people listen to podcasts. Today, it's over 50. And, you know, so if you ask somebody, what's a podcast eight years ago, uh, two thirds of them would have said they'd never heard of that. They don't really, what's a podcast? I don't know. It's, it's a, a new, a new game or something. I don't know. Um, and so, yeah, I think that we are in the very early days of podcasting. And so, especially if people are looking for a medium where they can connect to people in a really meaningful way, uh, and not get drowned out by the noise, podcasting is a great way to do it. There are 500 million blogs. Okay. That is a lot of noise. There is something like a million hours of content getting up to, uploaded to YouTube every hour. It's some insane number like that. And there are only a, a few hundred thousand active podcasts. We are still very much in the early days of podcasting. And as more and more people are getting hip to the idea that podcasts are actually useful and valuable media, there's a lot of celebrities that are creating their own podcasts. There's a lot of businesses that are creating their own podcasts. What that what people might hear from that is like, well, great. So there's more competition. So what's the point? But what's actually happening is all those people are actually just growing the pie. They're not taking a bigger slice of the pie. They're growing the pie for everybody because it's bringing more people into the podcasting world and more people start listening to podcasts. The average number of podcasts that a podcast listener will listen to is seven. So if, if one person gets one podcast, it's like a gateway drug to a bunch more. Yeah. And so they'll start subscribing to more, to more. So they hear, they hear you, they hear, then they start listening to other people and they go like, oh, okay, I hear Dr. Lacey's show. Maybe I'll go check out his podcast or they'll hear someone else go, oh, you know, I'll, I'm going to go check out that podcast. And then they start listening to stuff. And then some of them they'll listen to long-term and some they won't. But you know, the more you put yourself out there, the more you give yourself a chance to intersect with opportunities. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And, and, you know, one thing I hear from from doctors, really a lot of people that want think they want to start podcasts, they're like, they're really worried about their numbers and how they can have a huge audience. But I, my perspective is you don't need a huge audience because podcast listeners are hardcore fans. Uh, if they stick with you for a few episodes, they've gotten to know you. That's very different. You don't need two million of those like Tim Ferriss and his show. If you have a hundred or you know 500 or a thousand, those are people that deeply care about your topic. And that's why you can really go niche. You may not need you know a huge audience if you're going with a very specific topic, but those people care about that topic. And I think that can be extremely valuable. 100%. You know, listening to uh, some, you know, like like we mentioned Pat Flynn earlier, Smart Passive Income. He's had students on that have been that have had podcasts for uh, CB radio scanner enthusiasts and goat farming. And you know, you you think, okay, well, how many people could possibly be listening to that? <laughs> And it may only be 100 or 150 people per episode or something like that. And then they start talking about, yeah, but then that translated into an online course that I built that I make $50,000 a year from. And you go, wait, what? <laughs> from 150 people that are listening to a podcast it translated into that? And it is it is really incredible. You don't need a huge audience. And here's the other thing to think about. So, you know, you know like you mentioned Tim Ferriss or, uh, you know, like John Lee Dumas with Entrepreneurs on Fire, you know, these big, big programs that get millions of downloads lifetime. And you think, oh, I can never get to that. Who cares? Okay. Yeah. So let's say I have a podcast that gets 100 downloads for an episode. Okay. It, it, if that's all that it gets, that doesn't seem like a whole lot. Now take the take that same hundred people and put them in a room that you have been invited to speak to live. That's a pretty sizable audience for a live audience, right? So if you if you're speaking to a hundred people, that's kind of a big deal. So why would we think that it's any less? And so I think putting it in that perspective can be really helpful for folks. Yeah. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And and you you hit the you almost took something I've said before, like it was like I'd almost said it. Like you're in the head of the other person when they're at the gym or driving to work and listening to a conversation. It's an intimate thing because they're you know you're not talking to a, a large audience where you feel like one of a thousand in an audience. You feel like they're talking to you, and I think there's something 
really powerful about that that I think is unique to podcasting. I really do. It's certainly not true with blogs, definitely not true with YouTube, uh, you know, TV. There, you don't, you know, you just don't feel like that TV host is just talking to you. Radio is probably the only thing close to that, but even then, they always talk about it generally and they and it's, you know, but podcasting, you really, you're in their head, you're in their AirPods or headphones. And I, I think there's something uh, really unique uh, and powerful about that. Yeah, there definitely is. is. I mean, for, for blog, blog posts, posts, most people are going to read a blog post or an online article looking for a very specific answer to a very specific question. So they're going to skim the article, scroll down to the thing that answers their question and move on. So you may get 12 seconds with them. You may get 30 seconds with them. On YouTube, you're doing good to get to two minutes. If you get yeah. someone to watch you for five minutes, you're in the top 1% of YouTubers. Yeah, so, if you get that on YouTube, they're showing your video first uh, in people's searches because nobody gets, I, I've done YouTube for a long time. If you can get to two minutes, that's unusual. So yeah. Exactly, but the average podcast is gonna be 20 to 30 minutes and there's tons of podcasts that are an hour. My show average is about 50 minutes and so people listen to you for close on to an hour that is that is a deep personal connection with a lot of time spent in their brain and so you really feel like it's a much more personal thing and so people are much more likely to engage with you long term and to see you as the person they need to go back to for information or for an answer or for authority and so uh, podcasting is a great medium for that kind of thing yeah yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Well, listen, uh, I've taken up a lot of your time, and I know a few minutes ago we talked about how you can sort of promote your your business or your practice in a podcast. I'll give you the chance to do that. If And I actually have financial planners that reach out to me about how, hey, I want to do more media like you do, uh, so hopefully they will be watching this interview. But doctors, too, if they wanted to get in touch with you either for coaching, your financial coaching, or to find your podcast, that kind of thing, how can they find with you and work with you uh, more than this? Well, the, the best way to do it is to get through the website. Um, it's thescopeofpractice.com, and there's links to the blog and the podcast. And if people want to know more about the uh, about the podcasting, if this has started to intrigue people, I would encourage people to check out an article that I wrote uh, called The Ultimate Guide to Being a Great Podcast Guest. Um, it's, it's really a, a fantastic deep dive on this kind of stuff that we're talking about. And so if you want just a step-by-step -step guide for, hey, how, how do I start to engage with this stuff? You can check that out. That's thescopeofpractice.com slash ultimate podcast guest. But um, the whole website will have links to the podcast, links to the blog, all the archived content. Um, that's a great way to get in touch with me there. Yeah, and, and I would strongly encourage uh, – anyone to check out your podcast. You do a really good one. You you and I have talked about this. Very conversational. Some are very mechanical. A lot of shows that are interviews where it's obvious the guy's reading a question and then somebody just gives an answer. But yours is very conversational. It's really worth listening to. Even if you only have a sort of a what you think is an initial in, uh, interest in business and leadership and that kind of thing, you'll get pulled in pretty quickly. You do a great job with that. Well, I appreciate it. Well, it helps that I, I, I'm very selective about who comes on the podcast. So, you know, I only pick great people, which is why people need to go listen to your episode because you're going to be on my show here in the next uh, month or two. So people definitely need to come listen to that. It was a great conversation. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. And uh, Brent, this was fantastic. Uh, I look forward, hopefully we can catch up uh, sometime in the uh, very near future. That sounds great. Thanks for having me on the podcast, David. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thanks.